to Treats for Troops and to give to the homeless folks. And I thought this would be a great chance to talk for a minute about our scripture passage for today, um, which is 2 Philippians 5 through 11. And basically what it says is that we should think of ourselves the way Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but he didn't think so much of himself that he clung to the advantages of that status no matter what. Um, when the time came, in fact, Jesus left his place of privilege and uh, joined humanity. And so when we think of ourselves the way that Jesus thought of himself, I think what it tells us is that we also need to leave our place of privilege and go to the places where, I have to put this down, go to the places where the people are in need. And that's exactly what we do here at Crawford all the time. We get a lot of things um, that other people need, and we take them out to the places where the people are that need them. We have candy, we have food, we're about to collect toiletries, we're about to collect coats. Um, so this is a great example of what this passage means. Leave your place of privilege, you go to the place where people need you most. Bye, everybody. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I don't know about you, but as I look at the world right now, I find it easy to lose my balance. Up is down and right is wrong and human suffering from both natural and human causes is getting beyond my ability to even absorb. I feel, I don't know, unmoored. And in those kinds of times, we often turn to our traditions, our traditions in culture, our traditions in the church, to help us sort of find our bearing and make sense of it all. And today happens to bring two of those things together. One tradition from the culture that certainly resonates within the Christian tradition and one within the church tradition itself. The first, of course, is Thanksgiving something from the culture that connects with the Bible's constant encouragement to give thanks and gratitude as a virtue. Searching for things that we can be thankful for, especially in difficult times, can help us from going down the rabbit hole of despair. The old count your blessings is a real thing and it's a real help. And that's not just true for those who have a lot. It's helped people even in the worst of circumstances when you would think there wasn't a blessing in the world that they could find. Years ago, I mean years ago, I read the remarkable story of Corrie Ten Boom. And she was a Dutch Christian whose family helped Jews fleeing the Nazis. The whole family was involved and she and her sister Betsy were eventually found out and arrested and taken to the concentration camp in Ravensbrück. Betsy died in the camp, but Corey lived and she wrote about her experiences later in a bestseller called The Hiding Place. You may have read it. I recommend it to you. But in that book, Corey often speaks of the exceptional faith of her sister Betsy. The moment that really encapsulates that for me is when Betsy declares that she is thankful 
for the fleas in the big dorm where she and her sister were housed. And Corey's like, what? You're thankful for fleas, girl? What are you on? But why was Betsy thankful for the fleas? She said because the fleas were so bad that the guards would not come into their dorm because of the fleas. And therefore she and Corey and the women in that dorm were free from the guards' abuse. Betsy died in that camp, imprisoned for putting her Christian faith into action by helping Jews flee persecution and death. She had every right to be bitter and angry and say, there is nothing at all to be thankful about here. And yet, she died in the glow of faith, something that her sister, who shared that faith, noticed and was inspired by and told about to the world and inspired all of us. All because of God's gift of fleas, of all things. When we search for things for which we can be grateful and give thanks, instead of focusing on the hardships and the things we can't have in these times, we grow spiritually. That, in turn, improves our emotional lives, which helps improve our physical health, which improves our relationships and provides a positive experience for others to look at. Thanksgiving, not as a dinner, but as a practice, is extremely helpful right now. Think of things, five things every day you're grateful for, really helps. But for those of us whose lives aren't as desperate as Betsy's, for those of us who don't have to worry about where we're going to get our next meal, or whether we have a roof over our heads, for those of us who have jobs and for many power and privilege and more wealth than most of the world, giving thanks can unintentionally lead us to think that we have what we have because we're somehow better than those who have less. We say things like, there but for the grace of God go I. And that sounds very kind and empathetic, and we mean it that way. But if you think about it, it implies that God's grace is with us, and we have that evidence because we have the good things, whether it's the health or the wealth or whatever. But, but for the grace of God, which I have, and apparently those other people we're looking at don't have, that's something to think twice about. That saying to the world, I have what I have because of God's blessing to me, and therefore if you don't have it, you don't have God's grace and God's blessing. That's problematic. When we have much, our thankfulness can easily slide into comparative thankfulness. Like the Pharisee in Luke 18, 11, who thanked God that he was not like those other sinners around him. Jesus ends that story by condemning that braggart and saying, All who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. It's actually humility that keeps the virtue of gratitude from becoming the vice of pride. And the other tradition we celebrate today, the one from the church itself, helps us better understand that nature of humility. Next Sunday begins the church season called Advent, which is the time the church sets aside to prepare our hearts for the coming of the Christ child on Christmas. Although Advent comes at the close of our calendar year, it's actually the beginning of the Christian year. For Sunday of Advent is New Year's in the Christian church. Symbolically, we as Christians begin the year at the place we hope to begin our lives, preparing for Christ to come into our hearts. We then march through the rest of the Christian year, following the life and teachings of Jesus, marking certain Sundays to remember different events in Christ's life, 
his baptism in January, Holy Week, Easter, Ascension, the Spirit coming at Pentecost, etc. Until it all comes to a close today, the last Sunday of the Christian year. On this final Sunday, we remember what we proclaim in every communion liturgy. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We call it Christ the King Sunday, or the Reign of Christ Sunday, if you don't like King language. It, rem it remembers that the story that began on Christmas has yet to be finished. And that when Jesus, what Jesus did here on earth has earned him a name that is above every name. When all is said and done, when God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, as we say in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus will reign. But what does that mean? And how does it help us? Just about every one of the injustices and divisions that we face today have their roots in different approaches to power and authority. Whether power is being correctly or incorrectly used, law enforcement, border control, the influence given to money, celebrity, and media, the power of being a citizen, the presidency, the courts, and both chambers of Congress. How to use the various privileges that we have when confronted with those who don't have the same kind of access that we do. All of it, it's all about power. Who gets it, who doesn't, who shares it, who doesn't have a share in it, what power correctly used looks like, and who has the power to decide to enforce whatever those answers are. With families both literally and figuratively torn apart over issues of power and authority, in swoops this last Sunday of the Christian year, to remind us that actually Jesus is the one who has the power to decide and enforce those answers. And if we follow his teachings, the justice that the reign of Christ promises us in the end can actually at least begin to be present now. That's why I picked what many believe is the earliest hymn in the Christian church as the scripture lesson for today the passage that describes the mind of Christ. We find it in the book of Philippians, chapter two, verses five through 11. You heard it earlier. When living under the reign of Christ, it will be the mind of Christ that runs the show. And it's the job of each one of us to help usher in that reign by cultivating the mind of Christ within ourselves. Here and now. The key to it all is in verses six through eight. Speaking of Jesus, Paul says, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In short, the most fundamental characteristic of the mind of Christ is humility, which is how Jesus taught us to exercise whatever power and authority we've been given. When we hear the word humility today, many tend to confuse it with weakness or groveling or a lack of status. We talk about coming from humble beginnings or people being of humble means, meaning that they don't have much. But that's a distortion of what biblical humility is all about. And this passage makes that clear. Biblical humility is about having both the right and the power to have it all yet giving it up, either temporarily or permanently, for a greater cause. Humility is what happens when love exercises power. It seems to be in fairly short supply these days, but we're not without examples. 
I'll never forget the first time that I saw Queen Elizabeth. It was as, as a child and I knew England had a queen, you know, knew basic bits of history and there were still monarchies in the world and kings and queens and England had one and there was a queen there. And when I'd think about queens, I, all, all the images of queens that I'd ever read popped into my head mostly from fairy tales, but you know, they might be old and wise, they might be young and rebellious, they might be beautiful and really evil like the queen in Snow White. But every last one of them wore jeweled crowns, long layered gowns and expensive fabrics and ermine trimmed robes or satin capes. You can imagine my dismay the first time I saw Queen Elizabeth on television wearing street clothes and a hat. She's going around London. She's the queen and she's in street clothes and a hat. I mean, why be queen if you're going to go around in street clothes and a hat? You missed the whole purpose. The issue that I had with the queen is the same issue that many have with God becoming a human being. God has glory and power. We imagine thrones and golden streets and mansions. We sing about those. They're in all kinds of hymns. What good is being God if you're going to go around in street clothes and a hat? The great God becomes a human baby? A human baby in a poor family? A human baby in a poor family in an occupied country and born in a stable? We're mystified and a tad bit disappointed. We expected more from the Almighty, frankly. Another example is former President Jimmy Carter, a cancer survivor at 96 years old, out sawing wood for Habitat for Humanity, right alongside his 93-year-old wife, the two of them helping to build homes for those who don't have one. As a former president, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter could do whatever they want, wherever they want. And in their 90s, no one would begrudge them a relaxing retirement in a comfortable, even a luxurious home. They have a right to that. They have the power to have that if they want it. But every day they wake up and choose instead to put on street clothes and a hat and serve the people. Humility is not having no power or privilege. That's oppression. Humility is giving up power and privilege for the sake of a greater good. But you don't need to have access to the power of a queen or a president to show humility. In 2017, I read about a man in Orlando, Florida, who was checking out the very last generator at Lowe's after Hurricane Irma was threatening the state. The woman behind him had traveled 30 miles desperate to find a generator to keep her father's oxygen running when the storm hit. When she saw there were no more generators, she burst into tears. And the man who got the last one turned around saw her distress and gave that last generator to her. He didn't have to do that. He had gotten there in time. He had the right to purchase what he had secured. He could have quoted her about the wise and foolish virgins and not having enough oil when the bridegroom came. He might have thanked God for his good fortune and said to himself, oh, there but for the grace of God go I. But he saw a need greater than his own, and he gave up both the generator and comfort for days to come. I have no idea whether the man professed to be a Christian or not. It was just a news article. But I do know that he had the mind of Christ. On this one Sunday every year, we have the reminder that if you want to rule the world, you have to be willing to serve it and die for it first. The message of Jesus' birth is that God loved us enough 
to give up the benefits of being God and to become one of us. But the disturbing message of Philippians is that God is asking us to do the same thing. Right at the beginning of the passage in Philippians 2 is this frightening little sentence that reads, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It's easy to let someone else give up power, glory, or the last generator in the face of a destructive storm and cheer them on. We get all misty-eyed when we read about it from the comfort of our warm, fully electrified homes. But how often do we take the humble path ourselves? How often do we give up something we have the full right and power to keep because the love and gratitude in our hearts simply can't be contained? Some today can't even give up the right to go without a mask for the sake of the lives of others, really? In the kingdom of God, Jesus says, the first shall be last. But that's not because God boots those at the front of the line to the back of the line. It's not like God says, hey, you wanted to be first, ah, I'm gonna make you last. It's because those with the mind of Christ are humble enough to step back from their front row perch and say with both love and gladness, no, 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 you go ahead. Or here, take my seat. Where does humility come from? Same as all the other virtues, it comes from love. I'll say it again, humility is what happens when love uses power. Our battles today are at their core all about power. And this is the one day in the Christian year that reminds us that the full-throated power of Almighty God is available only to those who exercise whatever authority they've been given with love. Power without love is tyranny. Love doesn't dictate specific policies. We'll always have plenty to debate when considering how to achieve our goals as individuals, as churches, as nations. But as Christians, this Sunday reminds us that the ultimate goals we strive for have to include just as much love for others as they do for ourselves and just as much love for ourselves as we have for others. Because we are modeling the love that gave it all up for us when God came to us in street clothes and a hat on Christmas. And for that love, today, this week, every week, we give thanks. Amen. We return to God a portion of what has been given to us for God's work in our shared ministry. Friends and members are asked to prayerfully consider giving in support of Crawford's ministries and operations. 
you can give electronically by clicking the button in the weekly messenger or on our website, or you can mail a check to 34 Dick Street, Winchester, Mass., 01890. Thank you. So